I just say that I have officially fallen in love with Seattle once again today. This is awesome. It's amazing to see what's going on in Seattle. Um, slides. Okay, the title of my talk is In Steve Biko's Backyard, The Intrinsic Value of Show and Tell. But put simply, show plus tell equals action. It's true, Hanson. I think that a lot of people are creating content, but if it just sits on a hard drive, if you just create content, it just sits there, does it really exist? Well, a lot of people ask, but what if my content's not good enough? What if it's, you know, if it's not good enough? Why should I even bother getting it out there? Let me perfect it first. Well, to wake you guys up, this isn't particularly very good footage, but this was shot by uh, George Holliday, a citizen journalist, back then we would call an amateur videographer, who happened to be there on the spot when he saw Rodney King get beat up by the LAPD. Not particularly very professional content at all, but what he did was he was there, he created the content, and he took it to the next step, and he got it out there, and he made history. I was very moved by this when I saw this in the 90s. So in the 90s, and I'm not going to say when, I graduated university. And after I graduated university, I studied anthropology and photography, and I went to Africa. I went to Ethiopia. A friend of mine who's Ethiopian tonight and I took off, and we jetted to Ethiopia. And like many tourists, I took a lot of pictures, took a lot, made a lot of content, came home, and showed the photos to the people, my friends and family. I made a lot of pictures, but this one picture is one that stood out and has a lasting impression on me. This I call Banana Boy. Uh, I showed this to some friends, and some people actually said to me, are you sure that you were in Ethiopia? Are you positively sure you were there? Because he's not starving to death, and he's wearing a winter jacket. And Africa's hot, right? And I thought, wow, wow. What would happen in this moment if I didn't have this picture to show him while I'm telling him my story? How would this conversation go? And I thought to myself in that moment that I would be a photographer. I decided then and there I would be a photojournalist because I thought photography was an extremely powerful tool to show people and tell people about the world. So off, the, off more traveling I went. I went to India this time. Once again, I took a whole lot of pictures, came home. This is back in the film days. And showed my friends and family some pictures. And this particular picture stood out for me out of all the other pictures I took. I don't think it's a great picture at all. But it was in the moment, it's what happened when I made that photo. When I made the photo, the woman in the photo with the skirt pushed the little boy towards us. It's my friend Danny and I. And she whispered, rupees, rupees, rupees. And I said to myself, my god, she wants us to pay to take a picture of this boy. And if you look at his face, he's not happy. He's scared. And I thought to myself, this is awful. This is an ugly experience. I'm so uncomfortable. I don't ever, ever want to feel this way. These, this is not the kind of story that I want to tell. So I thought to myself, well, what is it? What kind of story is it that I do want to tell? You know, I want, I'm setting out to be a photographer. I want to tell stories that are going to make a difference and change the world. So how am I going to do this? How am I going to turn this around? So I had the opportunity to go to Brazil on my own dime. So I went down to Brazil. But before I went to Brazil, I thought, how can I make this different? So at this point, my photojournalism career was sort of taking off. And I had some connections. So I called up an NGO called Doctors Without Borders. And I said, and I said um, I'm going down to Brazil. Is there anywhere in Rio de Janeiro where I'll be staying that I can work with you, that we can collaborate, that I can actually work with you and tell stories that are going to help your organization? And they said, yes, we do. We have, this we have this new pre- and postnatal health clinic that we just built that we need photos of because we're trying to tell the story about it, some new innovation that they've done. Great. So I went down there, and it was an extraordinary experience. Why it was it an extraordinary experience? It's because I was working with an organization this time. We were collaborating. I actually was going to create content that was going to add value to somebody and something. And I also collaborated with an organization that had built a relationship on the ground in the community. So instead of just showing up, this time I was able to walk through the door through a trusted relationship. And this way, and what made a difference here is it gave me intimate access so that I could see things like this and tell stories like this. I knew these people's names. I knew their stories now. So that was an extraordinary experience for me. So then it, this kept happening. A lot of organizations kept asking me, can you come and tell the story of our organization? We want you to help us, te help us tell our story. Come take photographs of organization. So this organization is called Rabor Village Project. And they wanted me to come and take pictures of the people in their org. And I said, yes, I will do that, but I will only do that 
under a few conditions. One, if you identify people in advance who actually want to tell their story, people who want their pictures taken, people who understand that these photos are going to be published, who knows where, but their personal intimate stories are going to reach far and wide. I want them to be okay with that. And also, I said to them, I don't want AIDS to be in the picture. I think there's enough pictures of people with AIDS, and it brings back a negative picture. I want to show these people as real people, as human beings and heroes. And Hanson, you asked me, why not Hollywood earlier this week? Why don't I go in the direction of Hollywood? This is why I don't go in the direction of Hollywood, because these people inspire me. These are the people that day by day face seemingly insurmountable problems, right? and they face them day by day with their community and with community support. No weapons of mass destruction, no big bank accounts, no big expense accounts, just community support and hard work. And this is my biggest hero of all. This is Caxton Odiambo. Caxton, among other things, lost his entire family to HIV AIDS, except with the exception of his brother and sister. But besides that, Caxton every single day wakes up, goes to the farm, works really hard, then goes to school, then comes home, and he does it every day. And who inspires him? Nobody. He just does it. These are my heroes. So I had the honor of hearing Caxton's story when I was working with Rabor Village Project. And at the end of our interview, he looked me in the eyes and he said, Amanda, I just feel like somebody who doesn't exist. I don't feel like the world even knows that I exist. And I looked back at him and I said, Caxton, I promise you, people will know that you exist. This is my hero. So I am fortunate enough to do this kind of work, right? And so now the work is getting published, it's getting into magazines, it's winning all kinds of awards. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, who cares if I'm winning all these awards? Like, what matters to Caxton as the story gets out there? And then a publisher comes up to me and says, oh, I want to publish a, a book of your work and your journals. So I said, sure. And I want to call it, Can I Come With You? And they said, oh, that's a weird name. Why do you want to call it, Can I Come With You? I said, because all along my career, people keep saying to me, I want to come with you. I want to schlep your bags. I want to watch. I want to, I want to have the same experience. I want, I, want to, I want to take my travels to a deeper level and engage and connect with the people that I see. And I have been saying no to all these people because I said, this is not a spectator sport. You, if you come, you need to participate. So I filed that away, all these people wanting to come with me. I filed away different ways of getting work out into the world. And then all of a sudden, I discovered social media. This is back in 06, so it was MySpace. So <laughs> we know there's more than MySpace now. But anyway, so back when I discovered MySpace, I thought, wow. Like, not only is photography an incredible and amazing tool, this is an incredible tool. Now, this is, tr like, this, I'm a non-geek person, right, discovering social media. And I thought, what an extremely powerful way to get your work, anyone's content, out into the world. Or let's say Caxton's story, right? So my friends see Caxton's story, but then their friends see it and everything, and you see how it works. And since, you know, since then, there's been a lot more than MySpace. I don't think you, I even have my MySpace up anymore. But anyway, so I, so things, oops, hold on a second. So I filed all these experiences away, right? Like discovering MySpace, um, all these people wanting to come with me, all these stories that needed to be tell, all these told, all these people that wanted to know they existed. And I thought, what can I do? Like, how can I expand all of this? How can I take this to the next level? So I created something called Salam Garage. And what Salam Garage does is we take teams of citizen journalists, all the way up to professional journalists, by the way, but we, we focus on citizen journalists, and we go to international NGOs, CBOs, or we work with social entrepreneurs around the world. We collaborate, we work together. Everybody moves off in their own direction and works on their own project, creates content, comes back home and plugs their content into their online and offline communities. And this is what it looks like. This is Eduardo in, in India at a, um, this is an NGO called Vatsalia in Jaipur, India. I just looked at the time. Called uh, Vatsalia in India. And he's interviewing a women's empowerment group at the NGO. And so a lot of, this is what a lot of the content is that looks like that they've created, which has been incredible. We've had a bunch of successful trips under our belt. They're making blurb books. I'm going to plow through this a little bit. Uh, stuff is getting on Facebook, YouTube, you get it, right? So Caxton's story is now getting out there far further and wider than I could have ever done on my own. People are having exhibitions. Corporations, uh, Microsoft employees, for example, show up at the exhibitions and connect them with the Microsoft Give campaign. All kinds of awesome stuff is happening now. 
the content is getting out there. This is the content is being created of the content upon content. So all the text and story just continues to get out there, whether it's traditional or new ways of media. So then I thought to myself, well, now what? How can I, again, how can I take this further and expand this, right? We've got successful trips under our belt. So I got some funding from an organization called the International YWCA to do a project called Women's, uh, African, Women's of, African Women of Empowerment. And it's basically about African women leaders and leadership. So we did a pilot project about Miss Bundy Biko, who happens to be Stephen Biko's sister. Stephen Biko is the father of the black consciousness movement in South Africa. So uh, Miss Bundy Biko is an amazing community organizer. So we went to South Africa. And so what, what we did differently this time is instead of bringing a group of people to a country, I went to a country and had funding and built a team while we were there. So the team was built up of all kinds of people, all different races in South Africa, that's significant, and all different, just all different kinds of people. This is Odidi on the right, probably your right, um, interviewing um, Ms. Biko's friends and family and colleagues. The guy in the center there, uh, he was with the, oh, yes, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which happened post-apartheid. He was somebody we were interviewing, and the guy on the left, Guy, is on our team, and he was actually granted political asylum during apartheid. And so now he's back in South Africa working on this project. So we get to meet all of these amazing people. This is Mampela Rampele, who an amazing anti, was an amazing anti-apartheid activist. And you know, all this is happening because we just said we're going to do a project. It's amazing what happens when you say, you just say to people, we're doing this project, and this is why we're doing it, and this is our goal and our plan. And all of a sudden, everything seriously does come together. I mean, look at this, right? So that's Ms. Bundy Biko on the left, and that's Guy on the right. Ms. Bundy Biko is a person that we, were, um, that we were profiling. So when anybody goes to South Africa, they have to go to Robben Island, especially you have to go if you're in Cape Town. Robben Island is, the, where, is where the prison is, the prison where many political prisoners were, including Nelson Mandela. So this is part of our project as well. And I just want to show you some of the footage that we created, and then I'm going to end the show, my show. There should be some audio here. Yeah, there should be. Well, let me go back. There's audio with this. In 1990, the 11th of February, the government decided <coughs> to release Nelson Mandela. And many of us also followed thereafter. And we started sitting down, negotiating for a peaceful settlement in this country. No more fighting now. My name is Itumeleng Makwela from Gauteng Province, yes, Johannesburg. I read a lot of books, I exercise, I was always close with my comrades, would make jokes and all that. So those things, they made me forget about, about my sentence. Those are the things that kept me going. There were good moments, of course, not only the bad ones. There were good moments here in prison. We learned a lot of things, you know, through other comrades. And some of those comrades, even today, we are still close. To be a great leader, you should be with people. Stay with the people on the ground. Listen to your people, and you stand for them. You fight with them. Visit your people, talk with them, sit down with them. Then you are a great leader. Always be there for the people of this country. They shouldn't allow that, what we fought for, to come back again. So that gentleman was leading the tour in Robben Island. He was also a prisoner at Robben Island. And we asked him after, we pulled him aside, so instead of just taking the tour, we engaged with him. We wanted to connect with him rather than just taking the tour. So I asked him, what, you know, what was it like to start leading tours in a place where you were once a prisoner? Like, how does it, what does that feel like for you? And I got a completely different response that I thought I would get. His answer was, was that he was shy and that he felt self-conscious and nervous, just like me, <laughs> up on stage talking in front of a whole bunch of people. And he said, I didn't feel like I had anything worth telling anybody. I didn't think I had anything to say. And it wasn't until people started asking questions, it wasn't until people started engaging me, I'm him, him speaking, engaging him, that he actually realized he had a story to tell. And now, not only does he have a story to tell, but this is a very important part of history, not only African history, but world history. So my last piece is I'm going to finally take you to Stephen Biko's backyard. Hopefully, if you don't know who Stephen Biko is, I'm sure you'll, you're looking him up right now. But anyway, <laughs> um, 
so the last part of it, lucky, luckily, when we went to, um, when we went on the, uh, when we did the project, we were invited to uh, Miss ben Bundy Biko's nephew's wedding, who happens to be Stephen Biko's son. So the Bikos are Kosa people. So when we were there, we were, we were able to witness a traditional Kosa wedding. And so this is what it looks like. And this is actually in Stephen Biko's yard. And this is what it looks like when you get with people and you engage with people. We get, there's audio here, too. Yes. <laughs> Everybody getting ready for the wedding. Family and friends hanging out in the backyard. Nothing really special. But so very special. So when I, I was there recording audio, I was, you know, down by the fire like this, like capturing audio. You can't talk, right, when you're recording audio, obviously. So I was there recording audio, and I was completely overcome by this feeling of family and joy and love and inclusion. And I felt welcomed. And I went up to Mampela Rampele, another person you ought to Google. I went up to her and said to her, Mampela, how could anybody, once you engage with people, once you connect with people, how could you ever be here at this fire in this backyard and see people as unequal? How could you, how can you ever see this as unequal or not good enough? the way apartheid did. And she looked me in the eyes and she said, exactly. She said, you take that story home to your country. So I, so I am. <laughs> oh, I'm not done. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> um, anyway, the end of, um, the last thing I want to add is where we're headed with Salam Garage now is, is mobile reporting and data mapping. And if you're interested in, um, and being a part of that this summer, um, this is how you reach me. And the last thing I want to say to all of you is that you all literally in the, at, at your fingertips have the power to create content, powerful, meaningful content that will connect people, that will engage people, and that will create media, and media that's transparent, and media that's inclusive. What will you show and tell? Thank you.